everyone, I'm Vanessa Kamatsi. My guest today on Interview 360 may have the coolest job ever. It also may freak you out a little bit. Zach Lemon is here. He is an entomologist and a bug chef. Zach can shed some light on why we should be totally fine with eating certain bugs and insects. And as an entomologist, he can help us understand why bugs are important to all living things on our planet. Zach, so good to see you. Thanks for having me. I know some people are, you know, going to be a little bugged out about the whole insect eating thing, but uh, first let's just talk about your work as an entomologist. Well, it's always important for me to start with, I don't have an entomology degree, and I've never had a day of culinary training in my life. So here I am as an entomologist and bug chef. You know, how with does that the, even happen, with, right? With the coolest job title ever. And to, to quote E.O. Wilson, who is a famous biologist and who is an ant specialist, uh, he has been asked over his decades-long career, how did you get into this? And I like to just say what he said, which is most children have a bug period, and I just didn't grow out of mine. <laughs> I love that. But now going back, you, you do have credentials because you work at the Audubon Insectorium and a butterfly garden. So tell me about your your day-to-day -day and, and working there. Cool place. Yeah, yeah. So I wore my staff shirt just so that everybody could understand, uh, especially folks in the U.S., there's a difference between the Audubon Society, which is a terrific organization, but it's focused mainly on birders and birding. My company, or the one I work for, is the Audubon Nature Institute, and we operate a family of parks and museums in New Orleans dedicated to nature. So we operate the zoo in the city. We operate the aquarium. These are fantastic facilities. And then, uh, more recently, we're about 10 and a half years old, there's the Audubon Butterfly Garden and Insectarium. And how many bugs do you house there in total, more or less? Well, that's a tricky question. I uh, don't know if we went over this before. We have about 70 live arthropod exhibits. Arthropods are insects and their close kin, like arachnids and millipedes and centipedes and crustaceans. So most of these exhibits may have one to 20 bugs in them. So you add that, you know, you multiply by 70, that's not a very big number. But our butterfly garden usually has about 800 butterflies in it. Our bumblebee colony usually has about 200 bees in it. And we have one ant colony that I'm guessing has around 75 to 100,000 individual insects in it. Oh my gosh. So if you really wanted to do a head count, a we, lot. we have a lot of bugs. <laughs> a lot. I wanted to ask you then, I use the term interchangeably and I think a lot of people do, but what is the difference between a bug and an insect? I Can we get technical? Yeah, let's get technical. Okay, so even, even real serious entomologists will go ahead and use the term bug as a catch-all for arthropods. Okay. And as I said earlier, arthropods include these five big groups, arachnids, which are spiders and their relatives, mm -hmm. Millipedes, centipedes, crustaceans, and insects. Okay. They all have an exoskeleton, a hard outer skin that they have to shed in order to grow, and they all have jointed appendages. Mm -hmm. So this separates them from other, let's say, crawly things, <laughs> like, like uh, 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 sea urchins, uh, snails and slugs, jellyfish. All of these things don't have bones, which is true of arthropods also. Correct. But the arthropods are different. So let's drill down on this, 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 this phrase, okay. you know, insects and bugs. So when I say bug, when most people say bug, they're referring to this group, arthropods. Mm -hmm. Maybe they mean the insects in particular. However, if you're an entomologist, you have these taxonomic categories, these ways of classifying insects into more and more precise groups. Mm -hmm. So you know what an insect is when you see it, but you also know there's a difference between a dragonfly and a butterfly and a beetle when you see them. Yeah. So they're all different. Well, there's one group that is known as true bugs. I like that name, true bugs. <laughs> they, and they all have wings that are partly membranous mm -hmm. and partly leathery. Okay. And they all have piercing and sucking mouth parts. And this separates true bugs from butterflies, from dragonflies, from grasshoppers, from ants, and so on. Okay. So if you talk to a serious entomologist thinking about the term true bug, they will say all bugs are insects. Not all insects are bugs. I used to be obsessed with those, and I don't know the proper name, but they were like roly polies, and they used to roll up. What, what are those called? I loved them as a kid. They're <laughs> called pill bugs. Pill bugs. They okay. are a crustacean group known as isopods, and the funny thing is, they look like sort of a, a squished up millipede. Yeah, but they're exactly. not even they're not even in the same, same class of arthropods. Uh, you, you know, most crustaceans live in the water, and your roly polies, my roly polies, <laughs> I loved them too as a kid. Uh, I used to make little farms for them. Uh -huh. uh, you know, oh, with, with little cool. with little caves and tunnels and routes and houses and <laughs> stuff like that. And and they're, they're unusual because they're a, they're a terrestrial crustacean. Bugs and insects are very important in so many ways. Like I said in the intro. 
They're so important. So I guess explain a little bit more why they're so essential to our planet. Sure. And thank you for asking me that because I get caught up in talking, you know, in an interview. And when I have a, an audience in front of me, I always make it a point to talk about the significant things that insects do. It doesn't matter whether it's a kindergarten class or folks in a retirement home, a church group, a festival. Here's what you need to know. Uh -huh. Okay. There are, in a food pyramid, there is a base. And that base, the bottom of that food pyramid, is the things that get eaten the most. Mm -hmm. That's plants. And then right on top of that, and numerically, there has to be more of the eaten than the eater, okay, right? Okay, right. So right on top of plants are things that eat plants. And the things that eat the most plants are bugs. Mm -hmm. So if you took bugs out of that, you would suddenly have a pretty unstable pyramid. So if you think about ecological systems that are held together, there are so many bugs by volume that they're bound to be important because of how much they're eating and because how many of them there are for other things up the chain to eat. Even if you hate bugs, you might like birds, you might like frogs, you might like opossums, you might like lizards, and a lot of things rely on bugs in their diet. So you know, when I get asked, what's the purpose of a flea? Why did nature make a mosquito? It's always in this because it doesn't do any good for us <laughs> since. Right. But the fact because the they bite. The fact <laughs> of the matter is that, that, that natural systems need insects or they would collapse. And, and that's partly because of their role in the food chain. But also, that was just number one, they aerate soil mm -hmm. and they decompose and recycle nutrients. And so those last three things basically make soil good for plant growth. Right. And the last time I and checked, we, need we, our plants. we get all of our oxygen and most of our food directly or indirectly from plants. Mm -hmm. So if soil gets compacted, roots can't grow. Right. And if soil isn't nutrient rich, plants can't grow. And there is this unimaginable volume of activity that happens under our feet all the time, thanks to insects that aid in healthy soil. And, Wait, and so, so you're going to tell me that there's something good about mosquitoes then? I am, but I'll get back to that in a second. Okay. Last thing that I wanted to mention was pollination. Pollination, yes, we, very important. And we, and we tend to think only of honeybees when we think of pollinators, but mm -hmm. most bees in the world are solitary. They live by themselves, but there are billions of them, and ants and bees and wasps and flies and mosquitoes and a multitude of beetles and butterflies and moths all visit flowers for nectar or pollen. Mm -hmm. And if their bodies have enough hairy structures or others on them, they pick up pollen and they move it from plant to plant. The take home message is this. Depending on who you ask, there are about 350,000 species of flowering plants. They don't set seed. A seed isn't created unless they are pollinated. A few of them can pollinate themselves or use wind to move pollen, but the vast majority of plants in the world need an animal to move mm -hmm. pollen. And insects do by far the heavy lifting there. There are birds and bats that pollinate also, but the but fact the of the bees, matter is the bees do that. Not heavy just lifting, bees, no? all those other insects yeah. I named as well. If they weren't pollinating plants, our landscapes would just be devoid of, of almost all the plants that we're used to seeing. So those are the reasons why we should care about bugs. Uh, our terrestrial ecosystems would just fall apart without them. Now, mosquitoes. Yes. I said, I said a minute ago, when we ask these questions about pest species, you know, why did nature bother to make this thing that is such a pain to me and to <laughs> us, right? Well, who's to say that nature didn't make mosquitoes precisely to control human populations? And so from our perspective, we might think mosquitoes shouldn't exist, but from the standpoint of the whole system, we need which each we're part other. of, no matter how city-fied we get and yeah. how civilized we get, <laughs> You know, we're, we're, we're part of a system. You can't have I mean, one In the interest the of self-preservation, do I want to get malaria? No. No. But that's why mosquitoes are out there. That's true. That's true. Now, that said, as I mentioned earlier, there's so many of them that they are food for lots of other things also. So and this, I mean, despite their negative impact on humans. And they're, they're definitely the most dangerous animal on the planet from our perspective by virtue of their ability to spread disease. But that right. doesn't mean that all mosquitoes are bad. Well, so your specialty is with spiders, though, right? That's my main area of interest, yeah. Okay. If I can said to be, you know, moderately expertish somewhere, <laughs> it would be spiders. Why, yeah, what is it about spiders for you, why you kind of chose to hone in on knowing more about them? I mean, I know a lot of people watched the movie Arachnophobia growing up, and that probably scared a lot of people off. But Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but well, when you think about it, predatory things, things with fangs and claws and teeth, Hollywood always turns him into some kind of bad guy. It doesn't matter whether it's a tiny little spider or a crocodile or a gorilla. You know, if, it's, if, it, if it can be made big and strong and scary, you know, that can be manipulated into some great entertainment. I think I got into spiders because I really liked watching them hunt and, and, and 
capture and kill prey. Um, I mean, I, I would say like a lot of little boys, that kind of violence yeah, somehow in our society that. was sort of appealing to me. Um, but, but remember, spiders, unlike only female mosquitoes bite, Unlike mosquitoes, which are biting us for a reason, they need the blood to form their eggs, spiders have no interest in biting us. So your chances of getting bitten by a spider are pretty darn low in the first place, and being bitten by a dangerous one are lower still. I mean, you've seen so many different bugs in the world, I imagine. What are just some of your favorite ones, or some of the maybe more exotic, weird, strange ones? Uh, well, one of the things that's unusual is to find a katydid, typically a green insect related to crickets and grasshoppers, uh -huh. with flattened wings that looks very much like a leaf. And when you find one that's not green, it's kind of unusual, and we have it right in Louisiana. What there, color is it? Well, there, there's a species of katydid, we have several, called the oblong-winged katydid. And this normally green critter, which you can't even find on plants, it hides so well, occasionally produces yellow and pink individuals. <gasps> There's a pink bug out there? Oh, yeah. that's my, okay. Yeah, and it's not like it's brown, but kind of sort of pink if you look at it right. I mean, it's Like hot pink. pink yeah. So, so, oh. Yeah. And there's a gradation. Sometimes it's a little more reddish orange, sometimes it's peach colored, but, but and there's light pink, and then there's that hot pink, you know. Oh, that's I so... I mean, like it could hide on your lipstick right now. I like that, okay. I often tell people who, who say, you know, I don't like roaches, which is a common thing that I hear, I always say, you haven't met the right roach. <laughs> um, and I don't know if, I, if I've shared a picture with you before or not of this roach that mimics a ladybug. You, oh, yes, I saw that photo, I Googled it. That is not to be trusted, that bug. And it was, I couldn't even believe that existed. <laughs> I was like... Well, the neat thing for me is, is that, I mean, I, I like mimicry. I like it when you have, uh, in this particular case, an animal that has a legitimate defense against predators, and over the course of evolutionary time, nature has seen fit to create these things that don't have that defense, but look just like them. Right, and that's to protect themselves then, right? Right, and, and this folds into ladybugs, because, you know, uh, we're talking about a cockroach that looks like a ladybug, mm -hmm. we're talking about defenses, Ew, the yeah. fact of the matter is that ladybugs can do something called reflex bleeding. And they have joints that are hard and joints that are soft. And on the soft joints, they can produce hemolymph. That's the technical term for insect blood. He hemolymph? Hemolymph. Okay. It comes out in droplets and it is laced with something that is toxic to most insectivorous animals. Okay. So ladybugs are chemically defended. And when you think about it, it's, it's got alternating colors of dark and bright. And when you see that in insects, it usually means I can sting or I taste bad. <laughs> Don't eat the ladybug. Well, there's yeah. other ones, and we're going to get into that with, uh, with you being a, a bug chef. What kind of bugs are you cooking, and what's it like to be a bug chef? It's fun. Um, well, okay, so this started when uh, the then director of education at our nature center in New Orleans called me and said, hey, we're going to do an edible insect event. And there was a pregnant pause on the phone from me, and I said, that's great, and? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, you're the bug guy. And I said, <laughs> yeah, that's not the same as bug chef, is it? But I was summarily charged with figuring this out. So if I've got the right bug and I've cooked it well, it does taste good. So as long as you're not wigged out in your brain about the concept of eating something that maybe is, is uh, foreign to you. What do they taste like? Well, I get that question all the time. Mm -hmm. And the short answer is that if you haven't added a lot of other textures and flavors, bugs tend to present themselves, by and large, as kind of nutty. Okay. Now, That doesn't almond, sound so bad, But though. an almond doesn't taste like a walnut, and a walnut doesn't taste like a, pe uh, like a pecan. No. So nutty only gets you so far in terms of being descriptive, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, there is a difference between bugs if, if you eat them raw and if you eat them cooked. And there are some cultures around the world that traditionally eat certain insects raw, and they're better raw, and then the flip side of that is that if you look around the world, most animal flesh we eat, with the exception of a really fresh raw oyster and fish, right. we cook it. I, true. So I cook most of the bugs uh, that, that I work with. We serve edible insects, and because we've got good visitation, we can't go out and forage for the insects that we serve. You can do that, but we purchase house crickets, waxworms, which are a type of caterpillar, mm -hmm. and mealworms, which are a type of beetle larva from basically commercial insect farms that rear these things by the millions. And we go through about 200,000 a year. So what are, you, what are you making, like cookies, cakes, covering them in chocolate? We, we do make chocolate chirp cookies, uh. six-legged salsa. 
Okay. Uh, we have What's in that? Uh, mealworms. <laughs> okay. Uh, cinnamon bug crunch. Okay. That's great. That, and that could be my favorite. We've song. done red beans and yikes. <laughs> uh, we have all kinds of fun little alliterative or we, we think clever names uh, for our dishes. But uh, the point is that because those three insects are mass reared, once we get them, uh, they're very versatile. You can boil them, bake them, fry them. You could grill them, but you better use a skewer or they'll fall through the slats, right? <laughs> we take uh, a lot of dishes that call for small bits or chopped pieces of fruit and vegetable or nuts or meat, and we either substitute insects or add insects to it. And that's a very simple recipe for anybody who's watching here. Uh, you know, many people who don't know a lot about insect eating, they just go, oh, there's a lot of protein in insects. And they're not wrong. Yeah, that's all you really do kind of hear or right. know, really. So the fact of the matter is, just as fish and chicken and beef are not the same in terms of the protein, carbohydrate, and fat content, mm -hmm. there's no ostensible reason that we should assume a termite and a dragonfly and a June beetle are the same right. in those categories as well. So it, it's important to look over that, um, you know, to, to decide if we want to package insects and, and put them in nutrition bars or put them on a shelf in some other stable form, like mm -hmm. at a grocery store, it would, it, we obviously have to have nutritional information. Right. Um, I will say this, across the board, many different kinds of insects that have been studied have high amounts of iron, calcium, phosphorus, riboflavin, and niacin. And we need that in our diet. So we so really you can do a should lot worse. be eating. We really should be eating bugs. It's just about getting over the mental. I mean, that's yeah. really. Do you think eventually, especially in the United States, because I mean, I think there's a lot of other countries that, like you said, absolutely definitely do. But do you think that that we'll get there eventually? We've seen a notable uptick in the acceptance of entomophagy as a practice. Uh, startup companies that are making nutrition bars and flour and farm raising insects. Uh, uh, you know, for human consumption. And there's been this upward slope of more and more people are eating bugs, reading about eating bugs, interviewing people who eat bugs, right. right? So my hope is that maybe 20 or 30 years down the line, uh, in addition to, uh, you know, restaurants serving bugs, which is already happening in the U.S., we'll see it more broadly accepted. Yeah, I um, hope so. I've been in Mexico, and I think I had grasshopper tacos, and they yep. were delicious. Right. That See, this is the kind of advocacy we need. <laughs> and we're what they call the early adopters. Yeah, see? Right? People just need to get on board, and they will. Yeah, and, 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 and like I said, there, there's... There's no ostensible reason not to eat insects. I mean, that's part of part of my answer to the question, why eat bugs is why not eat bugs. It's been so cool speaking with you. I, uh, I've really enjoyed it, so thank you so much. Thanks for having me, yeah, Vanessa. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not gonna let you off the hook, though, because I also hear that you have another specialty. So you're entomologist, bug chef, but you also rap about bugs? You know, bug nerds get into all sorts of stuff, and my oeuvre is rap. <laughs> All right, well, I, I would How love to hear. How often do you hear... hear someone say that? My oeuvre is rap, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, not often, but I'm not surprised with you, Zach, and I want to hear a bug rap. I'll give you the floor. All right, before you goes like this. Okay. Yo, check these lyrics, put a smile on your face. Gonna tell you all about an insect place, a path to the door. People will be, it's downtown New Orleans on Canal Street. Now I don't want folks to think bugs are evil, so I might show them a real cool weevil. We got things in here that'll make you dance, like funky fly beetles and pretty velvet ants. Damn! Six legs, boy. <laughs>